Hey everybody, my name is Dave Snyder. Um, today I'm going to show off Tabletop Simulator, uh, basically and its use for Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, like many people, I'd been a DM that was playing a lot of in-person games with a group of friends uh, that were all local. And then when the pandemic hit, we couldn't all get together and sort of play our game. So I needed to find a solution that was out there. Uh, I had vaguely bought Tabletop Simulator on a Lark a couple years ago uh, just to kind of try it out. Uh, and when you know, uh, the pandemic hit, the solutions were essentially, hey, go use the established platforms like Roll20, um, maybe something like Fantasy Grounds. And I, I, I'll be honest, I found a lot of those uh, solutions pretty lacking. As somebody who plays the game in person quite a bit, uh, what I really miss and what I love about D&D is, is sort of the chaos. Uh, and, you know, people grabbing the board, moving people's figurines around, people accidentally moving uh, too too much, trying to get it past the D&D. And every time that I played with like, you know, Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds, it was just really too baked into things. And like the rules were really, really built into the game. And I just... I wanted something that like had people doing dice rolls, like messing up, uh, accidentally trying to cheat the DM, <laughs> you know, a lot of that kind of stuff that to me is part of the fun part of D&D. So uh, I plan on making a series of videos about Tabletop Simulator and using it for uh, Dungeon Dragons. But, you know, the first one, I just kind of want to show off like how I set up my boards and show you what you can do with it. I'm going to walk through a couple of my different boards and just walk through some of the features. Uh, so the first thing, uh, you know, as a basics, just to understand how tab Tabletop Simulator works. You set up a game, which is basically just a big physics area. Uh, this one's fairly elaborate. I will show you how to build something like this. Uh, the, the, you know, spoiler on it is, hey, I'm using a lot of things that are already on the workshop that you can just grab and replicate a lot of this stuff. But uh, really specifically, I just wanted to cover some of the things about using it specifically for D&D. So... Uh, when you use Tabletop Simulator, you essentially are setting up a bunch of different zones uh, or hands where the individual players sit. And you're going to set up permissions on the server that you set up. Um, you know, you're going to set up a multiplayer game and then you're going to come in as the game master and then assign abilities to all the players. So, for example, I turn off changing color, changing the team. Uh, being able to set up, you know, zones, doing things like table flips. Uh, that way, you know, I can sort of dictate who can see what within the game. And when we're looking at it right now, I'm not assigned to anything. If I came in here and became the game master, you'll see I can now sort of see through the fog of war that exists uh, in the game. Uh, if I change myself to one of these other players, like, for example, the pink player, I'm now sitting over here. And you can see that I can't see the board itself. Now, why this stuff is really cool um, is, you know, if we pull out some figurines, and these are, you know, figurines from a couple of my players, uh, we, you know, as a game master, I went in and set up the Fog of War. But if we came in and looked at uh, the toggles that were on the individual figurines, you can see it's got Reveal Fog of War on and off. Um, the nice part, too, is that you can actually set uh, the actual amount that people that that fog of war, war opens up. And so, for example, you may start people out and say, OK, you're starting here at the steps uh, and they can see that base level of the board. They can start walking through it. You know, individual players uh, can walk through the game. They can be in different places and they can start revealing the board. Now, this does work uh, with actual 3D effects. So, for example, if I wanted to make a, uh, you know, an object in here and let's just create like a regular old, you know, red square, right? Which maybe I should not put it within <laughs> the Fog of War itself. That's a cool thing to see, right? When we put it in the Fog of War as that pink player, I'm not going to be able to see it. But if I come back to our Game Master, I can set that thing back up. Now, these items, when you right click on them, you will see do not have Reveal Fog of War on them, which is why uh, they get hidden in there. 
Uh, any object that you throw in here, there's a couple big things that you can do. Uh, you can scale up and down the items. You're going to do this quite a bit, uh, you know, throughout the game. You can then also get in really specifically in this gizmo area, and you can do uh, some manner of scaling on these items. So, for example, I can make this one a lot bigger, and let's make it a little bit taller as well. It's hard to grab onto. There we go. Uh, again, uh, Tabletop Simulator is pretty goofy. That's one of the reasons uh, that I actually really like it. Um, so it's made a big wall, right? Uh, and what we wanted to show here was essentially, let's go back to our uh, you know, uh, pink player here and let's move uh, this person up to the wall. You will notice that it is not opening up anything behind that wall, but as we remove it, you can see that it's actually added some of that. So it the Fog War does respect the physics uh, of the game. I almost never use it uh, with that sense of it, uh, but you know, essentially, you can then you know move and reveal uh, parts within the board. What I normally do when I'm playing a game is I will actually set up a lot of. Uh, individual uh, you know items on here and again I will have these with the fog of war turned off um, and I'll place them on the board already within uh, the game so that as my players then go through and walk through uh, these individual settings what they'll see happen is you know a reveal of a character existence um, and so that's generally how I go up and set up um, uh, you know, the sort of things within the game. That's, this is the ultimate basics of like, hey, what is the basic, you know, sort of setup of how you would set up your D&D game? From there, let's now look at, you know, some of the things, uh, maybe some of my different boards so that you can see what you can do with Tabletop Simulator beyond that. So for example, uh, in one of my previous games, I had a big waterfall scene set up uh, for my characters. Again, I've got the Fog of War set up on here, but let's just go ahead and remove it uh, since you all don't need to see it. I'm going to set myself up as the Game Master again. Go to my zone area where I've got Fog of War, and I can just turn it off. Now, this was a really fun scene. Pretty typical. You've got people around a campfire. Uh, they're going to go around within that fog of war. Uh, the nice thing about Tabletop Simulator is you can set up all these different dumb effects. And when I play uh, the game, what I really like doing as a DM is setting up a mix of both uh, 3D objects, the figurines, maybe some little tiny effects, and then setting up the board itself. And, and the board being just a flat object. So... Um, you know, that just gives a little bit of life to the game. Um, you know, uh, there's the, the long and short of it is if you go to, uh, the, um, the steam workshop, you're going to be able to grab all these items at the end of the day, though, the only two that you need are, you need this Dwego's D and D complete multiplayer setup, which gives you a game board that looks very similar to this one. Now I've, I've modified his, I don't need all of the stuff that's specifically on there, uh, but it does give you the very, very base layer. He himself has added on top of a lot of other, think of it as like, this is like a playlist of a bunch of really good uh, workshop items. Um, I've then gone in and basically just added a bunch of models and a lot of effects. Uh, he provides you with a lot of these effects, but let's look at how you kind of set some of this stuff up. Uh, so I keep all my effect bags and things like that over here. There's this 51 bag of effects, uh, and you can see that there's essentially, you know, for example, a mini flame. If we post that on the board, uh, you're going to see that you can place this flame on the board if you wanted to hit the users. Uh, and they work just like any other item within it. Uh, the fun thing when you do these effects uh, that you should know is that you can come through here and you can change the tint of it. And if you remove the opacity on it, uh, it'll make it, you know, essentially so that you don't see that box on it. 
any item that you put within the game uh, has a couple different abilities. I think I've shown you how to scale things uh, already with it. You can up and down things, but uh, what you also tend to do quite a lot is that you lock an object. And what that means is that it just can't be moved. So where I could pick things up before like this uh, and move that around, uh, if I go through and actually lock it, it can't be moved. You're gonna do that with a lot of your scene items. And the reason you're gonna do that is because as the players are just moving around, uh, they're gonna be dragging and dropping things and things can run into other things and they can knock them. So for example, any of these other objects that I've set up, you'll notice that they're all going to be locked. Uh, even these, um, uh, these waterfall items themselves have locks. The board itself itself is going to be locked. That's a really important one because if you don't, you see this kind of thing happen. Uh, now that's a really big important thing to show off with Tabletop Simulator. If at any time something like that happens, uh, you can go into the game and it saves an auto state of it uh, so that you can go back basically 30 seconds in time. You're going to need it. Uh, it does come up quite a bit. You can also hit these rewind time buttons, uh, which will do that as well. Now, uh, let's load up another board just to see like, hey, what are some of the type of environments you can set up in here? Uh, here is, maybe let's go to one that's a little bit more elaborate. Uh, I, not that one, let, uh, let's go to our, Here's our base Eberron one. This was a train heist that I set up. Uh, this is going to show uh, how you can actually set up multiple boards, multiple um, hidden areas. So if we look at this uh, from the, again, that pink user's perspective, uh, they can see you know, the start of the game, which is, hey, they are on a train car. Uh, they have a bunch of different uh, figurines that are set up and then they have the the basics of being able to see where uh, those uh, Those other trains are but they can't see inside of them One thing I like to do with my games is I also set up playing cards uh, I think of them as like just sort of like NPC cards it really does, what, what I've noticed is that when you play D&D, people always forget names because the names are completely fantastical. So for example, this person's name is Tinny. If we hit Alt, we can look at their uh, player character or we can just look at any card on the, on the, on the board. These are actual um, cards. So um, Tabletop Simulator is used obviously more for D&D. It's used for cards as well. And you can actually use that to your advantage. I just like to have these things set up um, so that you can actually uh, you know, pull them out of a deck. So for example, I will almost always have in my saved objects a, uh, let's see, I've got, let me find my bag of NPC cards. And this is essentially how you can load objects onto uh, your board. You just come into that objects area. The base components that come with the game are obviously going to be things like, hey, do you want to pull in you know, a block like we did before? Or you want to load in a chess piece, right? Uh, you can load in a rook if you wanted to. Uh, more of the fun things are going to be coming from the Steam Workshop themselves. These NPC cards, uh, th they come... Essentially, Tabletop Simulator has a system that's just a bag, and that's a base part of the game. So again, if we go into the, that objects area, uh, we go into tools, there's a thing called a bag. I can just place a bag, and the nice part is that then I can take any object and then drop it within that bag. If I come and search for it, I could now pull it and recall it at any time. What makes it really fun and how you should learn how to play this uh, with D&D, something you're going to do all the time is you're going to come in here. Uh, you are going to uh, come and save this object and you're going to call it like uh, my Rook bag, right? And what that means is that now that we've saved that there, we can delete it. We can come into our objects area and we can now come into our saved objects and we can look for our Rook bag. 
and we can drop it back into the game. This is how I handle being able to have things like NPC cards uh, being portable or the figurines themselves portable. Uh, as I switch from game board to game board, I will bring in those items over and over again. So for example, I can come in to my NPC cards and I can find all the different characters uh, within my game. So for example, Abel Goodfellow here or Good Barrow uh, was a character that showed up in one of my other item, uh, one of my other games. Um, we can find Shepard. Uh, Shepard's a robot uh, that's also a bard. Um, so that's a way that you can bring in, you know, these different items from game to game to game uh, and make them fairly portable. Again, just looking at how this game gets set up, what I like to do is I tend to give all the actual player characters uh, within the game uh, colors that match what their hand is, right? So for example, I've got in here a group of objects that let's load up called, uh, would help if I spelled Eberron correctly, Eberron characters. And this has all the minis uh, that I have within the game. I've got one here for a character called Farky that is pink. And that lets whoever is playing in the pink area know that they move the pink board. Again, if we right click on this item and we look at the revealer, we can see the range uh, that it's allowing uh, the fog of war to be revealed. You can set it up as cones. I just make it easy. I set it up as a big uh, giant circle with a radius around it. And then again, I've got that reveal fog of war on it so that when Farky moves through the game, he can see stuff within it. So here's a good example. I just opened up something in here. I then as, uh, you know, the DM will come in here and hit F to flip this card. Uh, and apparently I didn't have any item on it, <laughs> which this must have been from a different game. But it's a good example to show, like, how can I change a card itself? So let me go back to my Game Master setup. Uh, and this is just a card, so it's a blank card, right? Uh, I can come in here, and if I want to, uh, I can change the face of this card to be any image. So I've got a bunch of portraits on here. Uh, this is just my Dropbox where I've got a bunch of my portraits. I'm just going to select a random one. You want to upload to the cloud, not to local, when you uh, basically use anything in here. And the reason that is, is if you're playing multiplayer, if you set it up local, it's just living on your machine. If you're setting it up to cloud, it actually uploads it to your Steam profile. And so when I do that and then import it, you'll see that we now have... Uh, this sort of halfling uh, person that set up. Uh, because the revealer was in here, uh, you could see uh, the actual items in here. So let's go and scan through some of the other stuff. This one was empty. Uh, I then took them over on this side. And as you can see, uh, things started opening up uh, within the game. There's a dwarf barbarian that's set up. They eventually get led to an elemental that's there. One thing uh, that I do to kind of give my games a little bit, my boards a little bit more life, is that I set up uh, these colored uh, spheres everywhere. And it just adds a little bit of depth uh, to your sort of flat boards. It's what's giving the kind of random color that's in here. You can see that there's a blue light sphere in here. If we delete it, you can see now it looks a little bit more dead, right? So almost any time when I set up a basic game, and let's just set up even the most basic of games because I think that's important to show off. So I'm going to show off again uh, when we looked at that workshop uh, that was uh, set up there. Let me, sorry, I relearn how to alt tab. Uh, this Drugo's d d complete multiplayer setup. In my workshop, I've got that exact one loaded here. Uh, let's load that as if you had done it yourself and then let's set up a game. Uh, so... You know, let's go in here, let's delete, uh, you know, this is the items that's going to come with it. Let's load in a board. And so let's, when you load in a board, what you're going to do is go into components. You're going to go into boards. You're going to go into custom board. You're going to drop a board down. And that's it, right? Uh, you're going to set up your image. So for me, um, I am going to... Get out of my portraits directory. I've got one in here called maps. 
and I'm going to load an Adventurer's Guild Hall. Uh, I use gridless versions of uh, all my maps. Uh, now, if you're wondering where to get maps, I mean, hey man, the internet's out there. Uh, go figure it out. Uh, but I love, uh, there's a couple subreddits uh, that are really great for this kind of thing. I also support a couple of different Patreons. I think CZE uh, is one of the better ones. I actually pay for a lot of my maps. Almost any D&D campaign, even if you're playing uh, something like Curse of Strahd, you'll be able to find that those uh, maps are actually out there and available from the artists themselves. And they give you really high res uh, versions of them that come in gridless versions. The reason you want a gridless version of a map is because as we drop this map on, you'll notice that there's no grid here. On any item uh, that exists within um, a tabletop simulator, you can actually turn the grid on and off. So for example, uh, you can have it actually project that grid and let's double check, make sure I'm doing this correct. So we picked a gridless version. We've got a grid set up. I don't know his grid settings, which is why it's a good example of how to show the grid itself. Uh, we can change uh, the ability for the grid to, basically you can make it brighter and brighter. You can also change the color of it if you want. Uh, let's do that here. There should be a toggle for, oh, sorry, there it is. Grid projection. That is what's going to actually put the grid on your surface. So when you set up a board, I like to set up the board with an actual uh, a gridless version of it. And then I put the grid on top of it by using that grid projection. You can also do a couple other settings when you go into options, when you go in here and there's snapping. Uh, I like setting both for snapping. And all that that does is that as we pull in uh, you know, a character, and again, let's go to my saved objects. Let's find my my characters that are in here, uh, which are just these characters set up. Uh, let's pull Shepard out here. You can see as I move him now, it's actually snapping uh, onto those items. Again, showing a really good, let's rewind time because uh, that one moved. Uh, and that's why you want to always lock your boards immediately when you create them. Let's turn this grid down a little bit so that we don't see it so heavily, right? Make it just so that you can see it. And then as we move this, you can see that it's snapping to that area. Now, I've found that the default settings for this board are a little too small for me. I like really big maps. Like for example, this map looks really big to me. I actually turn the grid setting down uh, when you look at the actual size uh, quite a bit. So I pull it down to something like, I want to say it's like 6.5 or something. Uh, and then that gives me uh, much more room to work with. If I wanted to, again, what I can do is now uh, scale up the actual board itself. Uh, and you saw the physics of it, right? It actually moves uh, this as well. So you gotta be careful with this stuff, but it's a way that you can kind of set up your board. Now, again, let's say I wanted to add that cool fog award that we saw uh, that I was doing before. All we have to do is come in here, pick the fog of war tool, draw it on the board. Let's go back, change us to a different colored person. And what you can see is that they do not see um, what's behind there, but because this figurine has the toggle of Fog of War set on, as they move through the environment, it's going to open stuff up. So that's again, that's this is me just loading up, uh, you know, something from uh, the workshop. It's going to give you the basics. Again, mine is very different. I'll bring up one of mine just to kind of show you uh, what I do in these. Let's find something a little bit more fun. What do I have in here that's fun? Um, I think I've got some very elaborate ones that might show 
the village. Look at this crazy one that I built. Where did that fill? Well, let's just type it. So you can get very elaborate with this stuff. Uh, I was running a Curse of Strahd game, and this one's going to miss some of the environments that were there. Um, talk about adding lighting. Sorry, this is a very old one where I lost some of the models. Uh, this is an older setting. Uh, one thing to notice, you can also change the background uh, that's happening in Tabletop Simulator. Uh, video game fans may notice this from The Witcher. Um, this is one that I set up the whole uh, uh, town of uh, of Barovia, the village of Barovia, and I set up a bunch of different figurines out here. And again, like I like to set up a game, you know, if you want to make it so that people can actually see stuff, it's just like web design. You need to draw their eyes to things. Uh, so when I go into that saved objects area, I pull in those Eberron characters. The easiest way to see stuff is if you color them very bright uh, and put them on that area. Um, you don't always have to use, you know, the fog of war. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. In this case, what I had set up was a scene where the town was on fire. The, the players were coming into it and sort of had to react to things. Other things that I like to do uh, with my boards. Uh, and let's open up another one um, just to kind of get this stuff uh, going again. Uh, let's maybe pull up this tower one, which was from my last game. Uh, things that I like to do is I like to set up two boards. One I set up to show an overview world. This is like the larger map. Where are the users coming from? In this case, I've got them in a town of Bay, uh, Bellhold. This is me uh, redoing an old 3.5 campaign. And I did, uh, you can see, another shitty watercolor by Dave Snyder. Uh, I, I like to actually do watercolor like with my hands, you know, like handmade. Uh, I, I'm not a great artist, but I can put something together to give some atmosphere. It makes people feel like they're in the world. Uh, here, I'm using one of those maps from one of those Patreon uh, folks. I've got a really small grid layer, which makes it feel like it is a huge, huge open area. And again, just like I told you, uh, sometimes those models don't come in the way that you want. You need to turn the opacity off on it. Uh, you know, when the players came into this zone, uh, they knew that there was uh, essentially a big tower. Uh, there was, you know, these islands that they had to go to. Uh, and then I had a bunch of figurines that were, you know, that they were battling against over here. And you can kind of set those up however you want. And then again, what I do is I set up uh, those NPC cards because people never remember they may not remember this guy's name, Bronk Nine Fingers, but they will remember the face. And that's something that I can always bring up uh, so that, especially when you're playing week to week or maybe once every month, people don't remember things all that well. So you need to use all the tricks that you can uh, to make this kind of stuff work. Uh, practically, let's talk about dice rolling. Um, so dice rollers, pretty simple. There's a bunch of dice sets that you can pull in there. You hit R on it, uh, it'll do a rotate for you. Um, that's how you can do some basic stuff. In my games, what we actually like to do is there is a specific uh, item in the workshop called a click roller. And what that allows you to do is queue up multiple dice. And then what it will do is actually print out who rolled it and what they rolled. Uh, and that way you can do like, oh, okay, I did 3d8 points of damage. And it will say, okay, you know, pretty decent roll. I got uh, 16 on it, right? Uh, so these two tools are pretty much, that's it. You know, figurines, dice, the dice roller is a little bit nicer. Uh, the other thing that I do is I've made my own initiative board. If you look at this thing again, when we drew out that, uh, that you know, block object, all again that I did, as I took one of the base level components, I took a, a square, I put it on there, I then came into the gizmo or uh, resizer bit, and then I transformed it so that uh, it was, you know, a lot smaller. 
Um, I, you know, I just moved this thing around till I made myself. Uh, I came in and changed the color of it to black, right? Black. I think I need to be picking this thing. Here we go. Oh, why do I don't want me to be? There we go. Um, so, you know, then you can put things on the table. I just made a big black bar. And then what I did was loaded some portraits on circles. Uh, again, pretty, pretty simple. There's nothing fantastic. You could use the cards if you wanted to here. But then what we do as an initiative tracker uh, is everybody does their initiative roles and then we keep the tracker on here so that each one of the players knows when is it their turn. Um, again, one other thing that you might want to notice about things is how do you get the tooltips on there? You just right click them. Uh, you can change these things however you want. Uh, you can even put notes on them. Uh, is a, I see a paladin, no, he's a cleric. Uh, and then, you know, that if you hold on to it, will give you some more information. I like to use that with any of my minis that are on here attaching all the names uh, to the items ahead of time and loading it up. Um, I think that covers the basics. The, again, I, I could go really, really in depth on a lot of this stuff. This video is already probably too long, uh, but this gives you the fundamentals uh, for how to play the game. If you're just going to go for, you know, you want to replicate this stuff in some way, the biggest thing that you need, again, is that Drew goes... Um, uh, Steam Workshop item, uh, and then if you also come back in here and look for miniatures, miniature, uh, there is a set in here that's called like five, uh, you know, D and D. Uh, and you want this D and D five E miniature sorted. This one gives it to you uh, within these four different uh, chests, and you can see I'm using those right here. What that allows me to do is now pull out NPCs, monsters, dragons, animals. I can now come in here, search against it, and say, "That's a pretty cool wyvern. I'm going to drop that guy on the table," uh, and then I can come in here. Uh, you know, changes color. I like to change the color of all my uh, non-player character items to white so they know like who they can attack. I turn, I make sure that the reveal fog of war is off for those. Uh, and then I scale it down to, you know, match uh, my board. You know, which if we're making a large creature or a gargantuan creature, it's going to be three by three. Um, so that's it. You know, that's the basics of, of how I set stuff up. Maybe we'll load up one more here before we end just to kind of show uh, another set piece. Here's another town that I set up uh, in the same campaign. And it's a good example of how to mix light 3D items and 2D items all together to build some atmosphere. So uh, we just have some 3D items uh, I set up you know, some colored spheres. You can see this purple one here. I can move it around on the board. Probably should have locked that one down. But then that gives some light to the game board uh, as people move around. Then they've got, okay, they're in the town of Bellhold. Uh, they're within this main area. Here's the bell tower, uh, everything set up. So hope you enjoyed this. Uh, again, I'll go into a lot more detail. If you have like comments or questions, you want me to cover something specifically uh, for how I run my games, I'm more than happy to do it. I'll, I'll cover them in subsequent videos uh, as time goes on. Uh, in the meantime, happy uh, DMing. See y'all.